Hello, welcome back. In this module, we're going to first take a look at the history in the capital market. The reason we are looking back in the past is to gain some insight to help, help us better understand how the financial market work. And here the term capital, as we have um, seen in earlier chapters, the term capital re refers to long term. So when we say capital market, we are, lo we are looking at um, financial markets for equity, which is very long-term, financial market for long-term bonds, and so forth. A very important concept in finance is that there's no free lunch. And what do we mean by there's no free lunch? Another way to, trans to describe this concept is to say that there is a trade there is a very fundamental concept in finance that underlines all finance theory. And this concept is that there is a trade-off between risk and return. You can think of it as um, the old saying that goes, nothing venture, nothing gain. So if you want to earn a return in the financial market, you must take some risk. And so there is a tangible reward for taking risk. The more, uh, and the trade-off means that the greater the reward, the, the, the greater the risk that you'll have to undertake. So we're gonna do two things now. First, we're gonna define what we mean by return, and then we're gonna define what we mean by risk. So for return, we can define it in dollar terms, and we call that dollar return. So that we distinguish two types of return. One is the income component, the other is the capital gain component. An important characteristic of an income, income component is that it's recurring. So just like your income, you get it week after week or every, every month or every other week. So if you invest in stock, the income component is typically dividend and you receive dividend every quarter. If you purchase a bond, the income component will be coupon or coupon interest and you receive that typically every six months. If you invest in a rental property, there will be a monthly rent. Um, if you invest in a business, that will be your monthly income. So again, the important concept is that you is recurring. Uh, the amount obviously could change depending on the investment vehicle. If it's a stock, it can change very, uh, the same for a business. However, if it is a bond, typically the interest may be the same from, time, uh, from every single um, time period. The other important concept about capital gain is that this is a one-time occurrence. You get the capital gain or it can also be a loss um, when you buy or sell the security. So if you own a stock, you realize the capital gain when you sold the stock. Um, the same thing if you buy a bond, you will receive a capital gain when you either sold the bond or when the bond matured. So this is a one-time once you sold the stock and once the bond mature, you will no longer receive future income. So that's the important distinction between those two components. Let's take a look at a simple example. Say you bought a bond a year ago for $950. You received two, two coupons of $30 each. You can sell the bond today for $975. What is your total dollar return? So first of all, let's take a look at the income component. You get two coupons of $30 each. So they'll give us $60 in, in income in terms of coupon. And you purchase the bond for $950, but you sell it today for $975. So what that means is you get $25, right? You, you bought it for $950, you sell it for nine, uh, $975. So you get $25 from selling the bond. So this will be the capital gain component. And together, you have made $85 on this investment. So a more, more orderly way to write that is your income component total $60 and your capital gain is $25 and you earn $85 altogether. Another way to measure return is to express them as percentages rather than dollar amount. Expressing your return as percentages is particularly useful when you're trying to compare investments because not two stocks will pay the same amount of dividend. So 
if you um, typically a stock that pays less dividends sometimes may cost less. So in order to compare two investment that has different dollar amount, you really want to express the return as percentages. A uh, dollar return is important because as an investor, you want to know exactly how much money you are getting back. So to compute percentage return, one of the important thing to remember is that you all the denominator, what you're dividing with, is always the purchase price, the original beginning purchase price. So the first component is the income component. If you're working with stocks, the income component is represented by dividend. So we call that the dividend yield. And for stock, the income component obviously is the dividend. So the dividend yield is just the dividend divided by the beginning price. Uh, if you're working with bonds, sometimes you will see this is equal to the current yield. Um, again, the important part is to understand that this is the recurring uh, component of your return. And then the capital gains yield component is we take the capital gains yield, which is the ending price minus the de beginning price. Again, the denominator here in both cases is the beginning price. There's another way you can express the capital gains yield. Um, the algebra works out the same. Those of you who are interested can work this out. Um, is to take the ending price divided by the beginning price minus one. The reason why this we write it another way is because this way is easier to enter into Excel as an equation. And you'll see that uh, in our assignment. So sometimes you may see two formula that does the same thing, and you may ask, why is this so confusing? Um, it is confusing when you're learning it for the first time, but the reason we do that is because it's more convenient when you have to use it on a day-to-day -day basis. So in some cases, it's easier to write a simple formula like this, um, but conceptually, it's easier to understand when you see that the capital gains you is simply the amount that you gain divided by the beginning price. And your total return is the sum of the two. Let's take a look at an example that combines both concepts. We're going to do it all, all together. So in this example, you bought a stock for $35, and you receive a dividend of $1.25. Finally, you sold the stock for $40. Now notice that in here is that the stock is now selling. So you haven't really sold it yet. So we're computing a periodic return. So we we'll say, what is your return as of today? So your dollar return so far is relatively straightforward. The $1.25 in dividend, that's no question. But the hypothetical dollar return uh, from your investment is $5 because you bought the stock for $35 and the stock is now for, worth $40. So you have a $5 in paper profit. So we include that. So $5 plus $1.25 give you $6.25 in dollar return. In terms of percentage return, you, we take the dividend of $1.25, where it's important is we always divide it by the purchase price. So we divide it by $35, our dividend yield is 3.57%. Your capital gains yield is similar. You have $5 in, pro, in paper profit based on your original purchase price of $35, you get 14.29% in capital gains yield. Now you can check and see if our shortcut formula works out to be the same. So at this point, if you, uh, I encourage you to pause this video and go through the calculation uh, on your own with your calculator to make sure that you understand how these numbers are derived. And together, you have a, a total return of 17.86%. Now, this is also another good check to make sure that um, our calculation is correct and you understand the concept uh, completely. So we make a total of $6.25 based on our original investment of $35. And that should also come out to 17.86%. So pause the video and give you a check. Now we have a basic definition of return. Let's take a deeper look at um, how prices are determined in the financial market. So the financial market is where buyers and sellers of investment, so the most famous financial markets are the stock markets, such as the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ. Um, less commonly known are other types of financial markets, such as the bond markets or the Chicago um, 
Chicago Mercantile Exchange where futures and options are traded. Um, the purpose and the functions of all these financial markets are the same. So they allow participants to have a lot of money today. So for example, someone who is in their 40s or 50s who are saving money for retirement, um, they can delay their consumptions so that they can have money for later on in time when they need to, uh, when they retired. Um, at the same time, there are other participants who may be younger who need to borrow money to go to school. Um, and they will be able to pay off those loans later on when they when they uh, when they get their full time job. So they have a mismatch of their income and their spending. So that's the that's the most key part. So in, if you do not have financial market, then people cannot borrow money who don't have enough, and people cannot save and earn a return on the money that they don't need today. So if you don't have a financial market, all you can do is put the put your dollar bill under your mattress, and uh, and you may lose out on inflation. So a well-functioning financial market is important because it has potential to create higher utility, meaning make everybody better off, those who need money today or those who would want to save money today. And the participants in financial markets range from the US government, foreign governments, companies, as well as individuals. Another useful function of the financial market, which is what we focus on a lot more in finance, is that it provides information about the relationship between risk and return. To see the relationship between risk and return, let's take a look at what uh, different types of investments has done in the past. So this is a historic return from 1925. Um, up to the year 2011. So it includes the last major financial crisis. Um, you can see that uh, the, all this investment starts at $1. And then by the in 1925, by the end of 2011, had you invested in small company stock, your one dollar would have grown to fifteen thousand dollars, five or fifteen thousand five hundred thirty-two dollars. If you had invested in large company stock, it would have grown to three thousand dollars. If you had put it in T bill you will have grown to $20. So you can see that the difference is substantial from $20.56 to $15,000. But this higher return for the small company stocks also come with significant risk. So you can see that had you um, invested your $1 by at the end of 1935, your $1 would have gone down to about 20 cents. So you have lost 80% of your investment. Um, you can see that the lines are a lot more jagged for the small company stock. Uh, it took a very big dive in 2008 during the financial crisis. The same is true for large, for large company stocks. Um, on the other hand, had you invest in T-bills, it seldom really take a dip. It's a very smooth line um, over time. And it's still outpass inflation. So the inflation is included in here as a benchmark. So what that tells us is something that cost you a dollar in 1925 would have cost you $12.59. So more than 12 times as much uh, by 2011. So this picture is the one way to give you a visualized um, expression of the relationship between risk and return. Another way, other than looking at the graph, is to look at the averages. So we take the annual return over this time period and we compute an average. So the average return for large stock is 11.8%. So if you hear people refers to uh, if you uh, the the statistics that if you buy stocks you can get about 12% in return, this is typically the data that they pull off. Um, you had you invest in small stocks, your return would have been higher. Um, corporate bonds will give you a return of 6.4% and government bond will give you about 6%. So these are long term, both of this, versus TBU, which is 30 days is much shorter term and that is a return of 3.6%. So conceptually, we, we understand that small stock is typically higher risk than large stock and we saw that return on small stock is larger than return on large stock. Uh, 
government bonds will typically have less risk than corporate bonds and in that indeed it has a slightly lower return uh, and TBU because it's shorter term is a lot less risk um, than long-term bond and indeed the return is much lower and all of them will, will have outpaced inflation so in other words if you have buried your one dollar under your mattress in 1925 and by 2011 your one dollar will only buy one twelfth of what you could bought before had you invested at least in treasury bill you would be able to buy the same item because you have kept up with inflation now that we have understanding of different types of returns and the relative risk, uh, we can define return in another way. And this way is to define return as a risk premium. Risk premium is just over the extra return that you get for taking on risk. So in order to define um, the extra, we have to define something that is a baseline. The baseline is this concept called risk-free rate. So what we are saying is that if we invest in something that is risky, we should get a premium. And the risk premium is the return that we get on that risky investment minus the risk-free rate. So the difference between the two is called the risk premium. So you take any risky return, whether it's a large company stock, small company stock, um, a business, a rental property, minus a risk-free rate, that represents the risk premium. The challenge in applying this concept is that in the real world, there's really no such a thing as risk-free. Um, so the best we can get is to find a proxy. And the U.S. Treasury bill is often used as a proxy because the U.S. government has been really stable for the past 100 years. It has never defaulted on its Treasury bill. So it's as safe an investment as we can find as an example. So if we assume that this is our risk-free rate, we can then compute the risk premium for the other investments. So since 3.6% is our, is our risk-free rate for large company stock, the risk premium will be 11.8%, which is the risky return, minus the risk-free rate of 3.6%. And that will give us our risk premium. So we have a risk premium of 8.2%. I'm going to encourage you to pause the video now and compute the risk premium for the remaining four categories and we're going to come back and check that answer in a minute did you get the risk premium for the small stock as 12.9 percent and for the government bond uh, of 2.5 percent the corporate bond of 2.8 percent if so congratulations so now you have an understanding of two different or three definitions of returns we can define return as dollar return percentage return and risk premium we have mentioned that one way to look at the risk is to look at how jagged the line is. If the line is very jagged, it tells us that the price of the investment fluctuates a lot, so that means it's risky. We want to have a more quantitative way to define risk, and that's what we're going to do next.